Where we're at with the uh, Lusaka project, things are moving along nicely. Still got a way to go, but we are moving nicely, and we'll share more about that next week in our service. So it's going to be a special service next Sunday morning. But let's turn now to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We're continuing our series in uh, this chapter based upon the parables that Jesus told, and uh, we're calling this Advancing the Kingdom. And uh, we've looked at four of the parables so far. We're going to look at two this morning. We're going to look at two parables together because they are a pair. Okay, um, it's the parable of the treasure and the parable of the great pearl of great price. And they are a pair. Now, pairing is not uncommon in the ministry of Jesus, especially in, in the Gospel of Matthew. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. It's a pair. Same truth, but different aspect of that truth. In chapter 6, when he was trying to encourage his followers not to be anxious and to be fearful and worry, he said this, he said, uh, Look at the birds of the air, and look at the flowers of the field. Pairing. In the next chapter, he said, Don't cast your pearls before swine and don't give what is holy to dogs. A pairing again. And so it's not uncommon for, for Jesus to, to speak that way. Now, um, the principle is this. Whenever a pair is mentioned, it's for the point of emphasis. There is a principle in Scripture in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. So repetition was used to reinforce a very important point. For example, when Joseph was in Egypt and uh, Pharaoh had two dreams, do you remember? The first one was uh, he dreamt, he saw seven fat, well-fed cows uh, drinking by the river and then seven lean cows, gaunt-looking cows, came up and ate them. And it was a, it was a picture of, of the fact that there were going to be seven years of plenty, of harvest and abundance, followed by seven years of famine. And the dream was repeated with another picture, uh, um, a stalk that grew up and there were seven ears that came off that stalk and those ears were plump and, uh, uh, you know, were good, healthy. But then another stalk came up with seven ears that were blasted by the east wind and were sorry looking and they consumed the first stalk. And, and the thing was repetition because it was such an important thing. In fact, have we got our um, thing operating today, David, or...? Okay, if we can have it up, that'll be good. This is what Joseph said regarding that. He said, And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God. See, repetition for the purpose of reinforcing a very important point. Now, what is the important point? Well, let's just, before I just um, come to the parables, let's just look at another bit of background to this uh, particular part of the chapter. Would you come with me in Matthew chapter 12 to verse 46? Just come back a little bit before this chapter, chapter 12 and verse 46. It says this, that while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Outside what? Outside the house. Jesus was in the house and they were outside. Now, some of you will know from other gospels that um, they did not understand where Jesus was at. They were, they were confused about his ministry. They thought he was just getting carried away and uh, he was even going insane. They did not understand. They were not where it's at. And they said, your mother and your brothers are outside waiting to see you. And he said, who are my mothers and my brother? And he pointed to the spiritual family. The disciples said, these that do the will of God, these are my mothers and my brothers. In other words, those inside the house had the privilege of insight because Jesus explained things to them. Those outside the house did not understand. They could only see through earthly eyes because their eyes were not yet open. Now when you come to chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, on the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And he, he told the first four parables... And you've got to admit, when he's talking about the kingdom of God, those parables looked fairly depressing. You know, a sower sows some seed, but three quarters of it doesn't come to anything. 
And in that quarter section of the seed that uh, grew, then the enemy comes in to that field and sows tears and almost suffocates the good seed. And out of that, with that which grows and is good, the good grain that is made into flour, the enemy comes back again and sows leaven in it. So he corrupts that flour. And it just looks depressing. It looks like, hey, this thing is not going to work. This thing is going to be destroyed. This thing is going to come to an end. That's how man sees it. But then he tells these other parables, which we're going to look at in a moment, but something changes. Jesus comes back into the house. Come into chapter 13. Chapter 13 and um, uh, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. See, until Jesus opens our eyes, we can only see with human understanding. And we will not get the full situation, the full picture. You know, there's a, there's a psalm where, where, where the psalmist was confused and was depressed because he was looking at what was going on in the world, the suffering and the injustice of the fact that the righteous suffered and it seemed like the wicked prospered and he was going down, down, and he said, my feet had almost slipped, almost threw in the towel. He said, until I went into the house of the Lord. And then I saw, then I saw as God sees, then I saw the big picture and his faith was restored and, and, and was strengthened because he went into the house. And if I, if I was going to call this something this morning, I would just call it come into the house. Come into the house and see the kingdom of God from the perspective of the Son of God. Let him show you the truth about the church. Amen. Now, let's have a read. There's a long introduction. hope we've got time to say something about it. <laughs> let's go to verse 44. Verse 44 down to verse 46. Here are the two parables. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now let me, before we look at these two parables, let me just explain um, a common interpretation. Very common, but I think it's wrong. A lot of people think that we are the man in this parable, that we are the ones that are seeking after God, we're searching for God. And one day we discover him in the gospel. And when we discover him, we go and we sell all that we have. We forsake all that the flesh holds dear. We abandon all our worldly companions and we put aside all our, our worldly ambitions and goals. And we surrender our will to God. And we dedicate our life to him. And in doing that, we secure the pearl of great price. Now, somebody said hallelujah, but I don't think that's the interpretation. <laughs> uh, you know, that's good, but it's not the interpretation. Because when you, look at, when you look at this chapter, you'll see there's a consistency. Who is the man in these parables? Who is the man? It's Jesus. This, you know, in verse uh, 3 it says that a sower went to sow. A sower. Who is the sower? It's Jesus. Then when you come over to the next parable in verse 24, it says another parable he put forth to them, saying the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Who is the man? It's Jesus. Come down to the next parable, verse 31, where it says another parable he put forth to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. It's Jesus. And we know that because in verse 37, it says, he answered them and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. So it's consistent all the way through. The man in these parables is Jesus. So he's the man 
that is looking and searching. See, he wasn't lost. Jesus wasn't lost. We were lost. Amen? And, and we didn't even seek for him. In fact, it says, Paul says this, he makes this point very clear. He says, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. No, not one. Jesus said, you did not choose me, I chose you. If he did not come looking for us and draw us, no man can come to me except the Father draw him. Amen? And Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He's the good shepherd that goes looking for the... And, and when he found this, he pays the price. We didn't pay a price for him. We can't buy our salvation. It's a gift. Amen? He paid the price. We received the gift. Hallelujah. What could we pay? All our righteousness is as filthy rags. And, and, and Isaiah says, you know, come, you that are thirsty, buy wine, buy milk without money, without price. It's free. We could not pay for our salvation. You know, there is a teaching that goes along the lines that I mentioned earlier. And, and it's, you know, some people preach the grace of God and then they switch. They say, unless Jesus is Lord over every single area and decision and, and asset that you have, then you're not saved. And, and it's called lordship salvation. You, ca you come in by grace, you get wonderfully saved by grace, and then you hear more and more of the price you've got to pay to stay saved. And that's not the gospel, friends. That is not the gospel. Hallelujah. So here's two parables. Why did Jesus tell two parables? Because Jesus has two elect people who are precious in his sight. Two elect people. And through these two people, he will manifest his glory and his grace. And this is what the Bible is all about. The Old Testament people are the Jews, the nation of Israel. Much of the, the, in fact, most of the Old Testament is about this people. And these are the treasure that is hidden in the earth. We're going to look at that in a moment. The other people that he has is the church, the pearl of great price. And we can see why one is referred to as a treasure and the other as a pearl. We'll look at that in just a few moments. But one of these people is earthly. They're earthly. They're hidden in the world amongst the nations of the world. They're an earthly people. They have an earthly destiny. One day God, Jesus, will, will reign from that nation, the primary nation over this earth. They're an earthly people. The second people are a heavenly people. They have a heavenly calling. Well, they, they are citizens of heaven. And they have a heavenly destiny. Jesus said to the church, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you under myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Two peoples, both very precious to Jesus. And when Jesus came, he came first to the treasure hidden in the earth, to the nation of Israel. I did not come except for the lost sheep of Israel. But then when he died and rose again, he commissioned his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To the earth, to the Jew first, and then to the Greek, the Gentile. So, so let's look at first of all the treasure hidden in the in the field. Now, it could be argued that Israel is the most fought-over nation in the history of the world, and there's a reason for that, and this is geography. See, Israel is a buffer between the great empires of world history. Down in the south, there was Egypt. In the north, Assyria, later on Babylon, later on Persia. And, and so <laughs> Israel was like the meat in the sandwich. And um, on top of that, of course, they were surrounded by hostile nations like Edom, Moab, Ammon, Syria. And often these would 
come across and make raids into Israel, marauding nations. And, and they would always pillage. And so they would break into houses so nobody kept their, their treasure in their house. Easy pickings. So where did they put it? There were no banks. They buried it in the ground. They buried it in the ground. That's why when Jesus told the parable of uh, the talents, he said, what did that man do with his one? He, he wrapped it up in a cloth and he buried it in the ground. They were very familiar with this analogy. Very, very familiar with it indeed. In fact, um, Job refers to death as those who seek for it more than hidden treasure. And Solomon spoke about wisdom in that way. He said, uh, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure. And, and so this thing was, was very well known. I mean, uh, you know, only the man of the house would know where the treasure was hidden. Some of you ladies are saying, yeah, it's like that today. I don't, don't know where he's got it stashed away. I know he's got it stashed away somewhere, but I'll find it. But so what would happen is at the end of his time, he might just die suddenly, you know, and the family would rush around, Dad, where's the money? <laughs> it's... <laughs> where? Slap him around the face, where is it? And it's I mean, vast fields, it's out there somewhere. And his sons will be frank, frantically digging and digging and digging. But often, treasure would be uncovered, uh, 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 not, not discovered, I meant to say. And, and so it would just be there lying, hidden. And maybe years later, somebody would dig it up. <laughs> hidden treasure. In fact, even today, it's a fact, even today in Israel, local villages are against companies that come in to excavate because they think they're looking for hidden treasure. As recently as 1998, an incredible discovery was made in a, a place called Tel Malot, where a company came in and they excavated to, to lay some pipes, and they came across this big vase, and there were 26,000 bronze coins in that vase. It's documented. And, and uh, most of them dated back to the 4th and 5th century, but some of them dated back before the time of Christ, anywhere between the 1st and the 5th century BC. So it's not uncommon for this sort of thing to have taken place. So they would have been very, very familiar with it. Now, the Bible says that Israel is God's treasure. Let's have a look at this. God said, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So you notice it says, above all people and for all the earth is mine. They were the treasure in the earth amongst the nations. The psalmist said a similar thing. He said, for the Lord himself has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure treasure. Do you know there's not one reference out of 21 epistles to the church ever being referred to as the treasure of God. But Israel repeatedly is called the treasure. Here in Deuteronomy, you are a holy people to the Lord your God and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. See, it's in the context of in the earth Israel is God's earthly treasure, his treasure amongst the nation. And right at the end of the Old Testament, the last book, it says, they shall be mine, the, the, the nation of Israel, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. Isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. Now the thing is that they are hidden amongst the world. In fact, in Isaiah, God says to Israel, um, look to the rock from which you were hewn and from the pit out of which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. And, and, and so 
he's encouraging them to, to see how they were just hidden there in the earth until he reached down and took them out as his special treasure. Now it says here in uh, Deuteronomy 32, when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. That's incredible. Now it goes on to say this, he found them, he found them, they were hidden. He found them in a desert land, in a wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled them, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Wow, he put a circle around and said, my treasure. He that touches you touches the apple of my eye. Hands off. My treasure. Amen? Now, when Jesus came, they were not hidden because now they'd become a nation and uh, they were there visible. But we know they rejected Jesus at his first coming. So what did he do? He hid them in the earth. You see, when, when somebody found treasure in a field, he had to give it to the owner, legally. So what someone would do if they found a treasure, they'd hide it again. The owner doesn't know it's there. And then he'd go and negotiate. You want to sell your field? How much do you want for it? See, and then, okay, that's the price. You go and sell everything you had to buy the field. Now, when Israel rejected God, rejected Jesus, the Messiah, what happened to them? They were dispersed. We actually call that the diaspora or the dispersion. They were dispersed amongst the nations of the world, hidden in all the nations of the earth. Hidden, not lost, but hidden, which is remarkable. It's a miracle in itself because any nation that is dispossessed and scattered to other nations within five generations maximum loses their identity as a distinct people. For 2,000 years, God preserved the Jewish nation. That is a miracle. They were hidden, not lost, hidden because they are his treasure and now we have seen that God is uncovering them bringing them back to their land ready for their redemption when the veil will be lifted their eyes will see the Messiah now this is important for us now Paul says I don't want you church talking to the church I don't want you to be ignorant concerning Israel it's not an optional extra you know, uh, Jesus expects us to be informed about his plan and purposes for Israel. You know why? Because just like the multitudes outside the house, they look at this nation today, the world looks at Israel, and it is the most hated, despised nation on the face of the earth. There's an incredible prejudice against Israel. Don't listen to the media of uh, you know, SBS and ABC reporting to understand the truth about Israel. Because though the world hates this nation and misrepresents them in the news and so on, they are the treasure of God. God says, you touch them, you touch the apple of my eye. Those who curse you, I will curse them, says God. Because they are his special treasure. And we need to come into the house and see from God's perspective the truth about That's why from time to time we teach about Israel and I believe that we'll teach about it again soon because what's happening in the Middle East right now is, 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 is a fact of the, the nations surrounding Israel lining up getting ready for a new phase. New phase of government, there'll be no, no more kind of um, tolerance and no kind of covenant between Egypt and Israel and so on. All those nations will become hostile as they're, as they're governed by extreme governments from other religions. Now, friends, we need to come into the house and get God's perspective. Amen? Let's go on to look at uh, the pearl of great price. Today, the diamond is the most precious of the gems. Um, but in Bible times, it was the pearl. The pearl was the most precious stone. 
and uh, the most loveliest of possessions. In fact, as we see in this parable, pearl merchants would travel to find the best pearls. It was a lucrative business. And when they found a really good pearl, they would sell everything, even their lesser pearls, for this one pearl of great price. Now, why is it that the pearl is a picture of the church? Let me just share a few things very briefly with you. First of all, the pearl, unlike any other precious stone, is the product of a living organism. You know how a pearl is formed. A pearl is produced as a result of an injury caused to an oyster. As something like a parasite or a grain of sand enters the environment of an oyster, it pierces the side of the oyster. It injures it. And the oyster releases this slimy substance called nacre or mother of pearl and surrounds that grain of sand. And then releases another layer. Then another layer. And then another layer until eventually, after a long process, a pearl is formed. So out of incredible suffering to the oyster comes this object of great beauty and great value. In fact, the offending part particle becomes the pearl of great price. That's fascinating because it's a beautiful picture of the church. Jesus died. His side was pierced because of our sins. And yet we were the ones that, who were the cause of his going to the cross. And yet we're the ones that have been redeemed. And by the very comeliness of the one that we injured, we have been made beautiful in the sight of God. Is that a great picture? That's a beautiful picture. The church is the result of the travail of Christ's soul. Isaiah says he will see the travail of his soul and, and will be satisfied. Praise God. The other thing is that the merchant, unlike the man in the field who just discovered this treasure, wasn't looking for it particularly, he discovered it, but the merchant actually goes looking, goes in search of this pearl. Now, you've heard me say before that every New Testament doctrine has an Old Testament story or picture to illustrate it. Amen? Now this is a picture, this, this, this um, truth rather is depicted when Abraham sent his servant to find a bride for his son. Do you know that story? Abraham did not want Isaac to marry a Canaanite, so he sent his servant back to his homeland to find a bride for Isaac. And as the servant went, he committed his way to the Lord. He said, Lord, let it be that you know, the lady that comes out and uh, um, you know, offers to water me and the camels and so on, um, uh, let her be the one. And so he came across Rebekah and everything that he prayed came to pass. And so he went to see Rebekah's father and he said something very beautiful. He said, my, my master is very rich. God has blessed him. See, the picture of God. Okay, he's very rich. And everything he has, he has given to his son. If a son, then an heir. Amen. Everything the father has, he has given to the son and and the father has sent me to find a bride for his son and i'm to ask this one question to rebecca will you go with this man will you go with this man and that's the work of the holy spirit who comes and reveals jesus to us through the preaching of the gospel without appeal will you go with this man and Rebecca agreed, and, and they both set on their journey back to Israel, 800 kilometers on camelback. What do you think they were talking about? 
<laughs> what do you think they were talking about? She was asking him all about this one she'd never seen, her husband. Because the Holy Spirit, his role is to reveal Jesus. And so on that long journey, he's revealing more and more and more and more of the Son to the bride. Hallelujah. And he's preparing her more and more and more and more for the Son. And what's the Son doing? You read the scripture. He's sitting in a field meditating. What's he thinking of? I wonder how beautiful she is. <laughs> I wonder what she's going to be like. He's meditating upon her. And it's a beautiful picture of how the merchant goes seeking a bride. You know, the pearl is the bride. The pearl of great price for the son. Here's another thing about a pearl. A pearl is the only gem whose unity cannot be broken without being destroyed. See, you can take a diamond, you can take it to a jeweler, and he can cut that stone in two. You've got two diamonds. You can take a slab of gold and, and you can saw through that and you can have two blocks of gold. But you try and cut a pearl in half, you'll destroy it. You'll destroy it. See, see the church is a unity. Jesus only has one church. It's not an institutional church. It's not a denomination. There are people in those denominations that are a part of the true church. But the true church of Jesus goes way back to the beginning. To when the church, be, you know, the church of all ages, and the church universal across the world, everyone that is born again, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is a part of the bride of Christ. He has one pearl of great price. And the other thing, and I'll, I'll close with this this morning, is that the pearl is an object that is formed slowly and gradually. You know, just layer by layer of this nacre is being re released and surrounds the grain. But it's, it's a long, tedious process. Now, we've seen in another parable, the parable of the mustard seed, that the church grows quickly and grows big. Now, that's numerically. But its transformation is gradual. Its transformation is very, very slow and gradual. You know, friends, if, when we talk about the church, we need to come into the house. Trust me, we need to come into the house and see the perspective of the Father and the Son. Because there's a lot of people that just keep on you know, knocking the church, the church this and the church that and the trouble with the church today and what's the church doing about this? We're talking about the bride of Christ. And then some people even just say, I'm finished with the church, it's full of self-righteous hypocrites. But they don't realise by their separation from it, they have become self-righteous. They're just too good for the church. Listen, friends, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her through the washing of the water of the word that she might become without spot and without blemish and be presented to him spotless and faultless as his one pearl of great price. Hallelujah. We're not perfect. No one's perfect. But we are the bride of Christ. Positionally, we're perfect. Amen? We're complete in Him. Now, we know there's a work of sanctification and, and, and it's a gradual work where we're being transformed into the image and the likeness of the one we injured. We're going to come to that incredible climax of, of displaying His comeliness and His beauty and His glory, conformed to the image of Christ. Hallelujah. There's a lot of talk that goes on even amongst Christians today about self-esteem and people getting a sense of self-worth and, and so on. 
I just wish that people would get their identity from the Word of God. From what God says about it. You know, we, we would not jump through the hoops of other people's expectations and trying to live up to their critique of us if we knew who we were in Christ. The fact is, your worth, dear friends, your value has been determined even before you were born. Your worth and your value is determined by the fact that Jesus sold all he had that he might purchase you. He paid the ultimate price. He laid down his life. He poured himself out as a burnt offering that he might redeem you because you are so precious and so special and of great value to him. He, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. Now you've got to settle it, friends, once and for all, who you are going to allow to give you value. Where do you get your identity from? You know the story? Somebody said, I, I asked God how much he loved me. And Jesus stretched out his arms and said, this much. Stretched out his arms on the cross. Paid the ultimate price. If that doesn't deal with our self-esteem problem, I don't know what will. Amen? Hallelujah. It's formed slowly. It's formed gradually. But we are being changed into his likeness. And just as Rebecca came to the promised land to, to the Son to share his glory, so we're going to reign with Christ. We're going to share his glory. When Christ is glorified in the earth, the Bible says, you too and I will be glorified with him. Let's just look at this last verse together. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Friends, my message this morning is God has two very dear elect chosen special groups of people an earthly people and a heavenly people if you want to know the truth about any of those groups you need to come into the house when the multitudes have gone away they've all voiced their opinion they've seen through their natural earthly understanding and see as God sees amen amen, amen. let's pray together thank you Jesus Praise the Lord. Father, we just thank you this morning as we've just looked again at how special we are to you. Lord, this is the good news of the gospel. It seems too good to be true because that's what the gospel is, Lord. It's just amazing grace, amazing love. It's going to take us all eternity, Lord God, to magnify you and praise you for the riches of your grace and your goodness to us. Lord, I pray that our eyes will be opened. Lord, like Balaam, we will see that we are a glorious people. We are, Lord God, a, a, a special people, an elect people. How beautiful are the dwelling places of God's people. You, Lord, no one can curse whom God has blessed. And we are blessed. And we thank you for that, Lord. And I just pray for an increasing, unfolding revelation to us of who we are in Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen.